Let's open our Bibles to the book of 2 Corinthians. I am going to read a verse here by way of introduction, but this is not my text. Second Corinthians chapter three. In verse number five. It says, Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of God. And then Second Corinthians chapter nine, verse number eight. And God is able to make all grace abound toward you, that ye, having all sufficiency in all things, may abound to every good work. Our sufficiency is of God. Now, I'm not going to explain a lot about the verse right now, but our sufficiency needs to be in God. I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to go to the text that I'm going to preach. Father, we bow before you, asking you, Lord, for the wisdom, Father, to bring forth your word in the way that we need to hear it this evening. Father, you must increase. I pray that you would be glorified. Lord, not my will, but thy will be done. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Judges chapter 9. Judges chapter 9, and this is the text that I will preach from this evening. Beginning in verse number 1, it says here, And Abimelech, the son of Jerubbabel, went to Shechem unto his mother's brethren and communed with them with all the family of the house of his mother's father, saying, Speak, I pray you, in the ears of all the men of Shechem, whether it is better for you, either that all the sons of Jerubbabel, which are threescore and ten persons, reign over you, or that one reign over you. Remember also that I am your bone and your flesh. And his mother's brethren spake of him in the ears of all the men of Shechem all these words, and their hearts inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, He is our brother. And they gave him three score and ten pieces of silver out of the house of Baal Berwith, wherewith Abimelech hired vain and light persons which followed him. And he went into his father's house at Oprah, And slew his brother and the sons of Jerubbabel, being threescore and ten persons upon one stone, notwithstanding yet Jotham, the youngest son of Jerubbabel, was left where he hid himself. And all the men of Shechem gathered together in all the house of Milo, and went and made Abimelech king by the plain of the pillar that was in Shechem. Now, I'm going to pause there in the reading. Now, I want to explain to you what's going on in this passage of Scripture to make sure we all understand this story and what has taken place. It says here that Abimelech, the son of Jerubbabel. Who is Jerubbabel? That's question number one. Gideon, that's the correct answer. Go back to chapter 8, verse number 35. It says here, Neither showed they kindness to the house of Jerubbabel, namely Gideon. Gideon was that man of faith, that took 300 soldiers and defeated the Midianites who were as grasshoppers in the valley because God told him to do it and God ordered the battle and God directed it and God used Gideon because of his faith in a great and mighty way to deliver the children of Israel from bondage, from slavery in the time of the Midianites. There in Judges, actually chapter 7 and 8. Okay, and, and you see here his son, Abimelech, wants to be king. And so what does he do? He goes to his, 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 his family, to his mother, to his brethren, and he asks them this question in verse number two. I want you to see this question in verse number two. Speak, I pray you, in the ears of all the men of Shechem. Now here's the question. Whether it is better for you, either that all the sons of Jerubbabel, which are three score and ten persons, reign over you, or that one reign over you. You see the question? Now I'm going to ask you the same question. Which would be better? To have the 70 sons of Gideon reign over the nation of Israel? Anybody think that? 
And how many think it would have been better for one man to reign over the nation of Israel? Anybody think that? Uh, how many don't think? <clears throat> Let me tell you, it's a trick question. It's actually a fallacy in logic. It's called the either-or fallacy. I'm giving you two choices, but really, it's not the best. The true question is this, what was best? That's the real question, what was best? You go back into chapter 8, go back to verse number 22. It says here, Then the men of Israel said unto Gideon, Rule thou over us, both thou and thy sons, and thy sons' sons also, for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. And Gideon said unto them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you, the Lord shall rule over you. What was best was for God to be their king. What was best was for God to rule over the nation of Israel, and that's what God wanted. But here Abimelech is trying to take the place of God. He's trying to take that position, and, but it's not available. But he's going to make himself king. And so he goes to his brethren, and they, they convince the men of Shechem and the house of Milo to give him 70 pieces out of the house of Baal Berwith, which was an idol that Gideon was a, a stumbling block to him and his family and the nation of Israel. And they took those 70 pieces of silver, and it says in the end of verse number 4, he hired vain and light persons which followed him, and he goes to his father's house at Oprah, and he murders his own brethren. But Jotham, the youngest son of Gideon, escaped. Now you begin to ask the question, what can Jotham do about this? He's the youngest son of Gideon. If he shows himself to Abimelech, he's going to be killed. He already killed all his siblings. You know, what can, a Bim, what can a Jotham do about this? Is there anything that he can do? His brother has just been made king. I mean, you know, it is pretty hopeless, you would think, in Jotham's position. You know, sometimes we look at what's going on in the United States of America. I heard a lot of prayer tonight for the United States, a lot of prayer for our country. And you look at what's going on in this nation, and we begin to look back and, and look at what's going on and just say, you're going to watch that 2,000 Mules tomorrow night. You're going to see that video unplanned. I mean, you've got to realize that, I mean, um, Satan is the prince and the power of the air. He is that spirit that works in the children of disobedience. And you talk about abortion. You talk about what's going on and the agenda that is being pushed to by the White House and by many members of Congress. We look at what's going on and, 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 and really, what can, what can little old me do about that? What can you do about that? I mean, it can look pretty hopeless. I mean, for Jotham it was. I mean, what can he really do? Is there any hope that we have? And I already expressed to you, our only hope is for God to bring revival to this nation. And I have to say this, I'm very thankful for that promise that he gave us in the book of Thessalonians. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And I am thankful that we have the Holy Spirit of God, that anointing of God that is literally pushing back this evil that is being perpetrated on the world and, and, and really the hope of America rests in this in you, it rests in this church and in every little church just like it across this nation. Let me tell you, we have hope. Jotham has a hope. Now, Jotham's going to go into a parable. And I want you to understand here just a little bit of, to help you to comprehend what's going on here. Okay? Where there is authority, there is influence. Okay? Where there's authority, there's influence. God put parents in charge in the home. They're an authority. God put dad as the head of the home. He has an authority. That authority is given to him by God for the purpose of influencing his children to serve God. 
to influence them to go the right direction, to influence them to do what God wants them to do. Okay? There's, there's, where there's authority, there's influence. Can I tell you, God has placed authority in this church? And that authority is there for the sake of influence. Who's supposed to be the influence? Who, who, who's, who's the influence? It's you. That church is there to influence you. You see, we have the authority. Okay? But I want to ask you this question this evening. What is your influence? What is your influence? Now, he's going to go into this parable about the trees. I want you to think of these trees in terms of influence. Or maybe yet, um, that just that idea of, 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 of influence for now. Okay? You know, and when you think of a tree, you go and you get an apple off a tree, and you take a bite of that apple, it has an influence upon you. There's an influence there. Everyone that comes under the shade of those trees, there's going to be an influence. Right? And so he's going to go into this parable here. Spurgeon said of this passage of Scripture that is one of the greatest treasures of wisdom that we can find in the Old Testament if we can truly understand its depths. And I tell you, there's a lot more wisdom here than what I'm going to give you in the next how many ever minutes this takes me to go. Okay? Now, <clears throat> verse number 7. It says here, And when they told it to Jotham, he went and stood in the top of Mount Gerizim. Now I'm going to pause right there. Mount Gerizim. What was Mount Gerizim known for? Mount Gerizim was the mountain of blessing. When the children of Israel came into the promised land under Joshua's leadership, half of them got up on Mount Gerizim and proclaimed the, the blessings of the Lord. In other words, if we obey God, if we do what he tells us to do, if we keep his commandments, if we have this relationship with God, then God is going to protect us, he's going to feed us, he's going to sustain us, he's, he's going to take care of us. The other half got up on Mount Ubal and proclaimed the curses of the Lord. In other words, if we don't, God's going to judge us. He goes to the top of Mount Gerizim, and he lifted up his voice and cried and said unto them, Hearken unto me, ye men of Shechem, that God may hearken unto you. Now, can I say there's authority in that statement? There's authority there. Hearken unto me, that God may hearken unto you. Can I tell you that is a missionary's message? when he goes to a foreign country? That is your message when you go across the streets with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hearken unto me that God may hearken unto you. I want you to know God. I want you to have this relationship with him. I want you to, to know he loves you, that he cares for you, that, and that he is there. And, and here he goes to the top of Mount Gerizim, the Mount of Blessing, and he says to them, hearken unto me, ye men of Shechem, that God may hearken unto you. And there's authority there. Now, he's going to go into this parable now about the trees. It says here in verse number 8, it says, The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them, and they said unto the olive tree, Reign thou over us. But the olive tree said unto them, Should I leave my fatness, wherewith by me they honor God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? Now the trees got together, and the trees decided we're going to have a king. And so they go to the olive tree first and say to the olive tree, Olive tree, will you be our king? And the olive tree says, Oh no, I'm not going to be your king. And what's the reason the olive tree gives for not being their king? It says in verse 9, Should I leave my fatness wherewith by me they honor God and man and go to be promoted over the trees? Should I leave my fatness? What is he talking about? Is this a weight loss program? Should I leave my fatness? And no, that's not what it's talking about. Okay? Hey, what, 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 he's, what he's saying here is a great truth. Should I leave my fatness? What it, scripture interprets Scripture. Okay? So keep a marker in Judges chapter 9 and follow me to Genesis chapter 27. Genesis chapter 27. 
In Genesis chapter 27, Isaac is an old man. He's got two boys, Jacob and Esau. They're twins. They're not identical, but they're still twins. Esau was the hairy man. He was the hunter. He was the wild man. And daddy liked him. Jacob was the plain boy. He was mama's boy. Okay? But Isaac wanted to give the blessing to Esau, but God wanted it to go to Jacob. And so he tells Esau, go out and get me some venison. Bring it in and cook it and prepare it. And he said, I'm going to give you the blessing. Mom tells Jacob to go get a kid out of the flock. And mom took it and seasoned it and cooked it like dad liked and put on that goat's hair on the back of his hand and the back of his neck. And he went in and deceived his father. And the blessing went to Jacob where it belonged. And in the midst of this blessing, one verse here, verse number 28. It says, therefore, God give thee the dew of heaven and fatness of earth and plenty of corn and wine. What is that fatness? That fatness is the blessing of God. Can I tell you, what is your influence? Your influence is the blessing that God has given to you. You say, what do you mean? Listen, we live in the United States of America. We have been given the blessings of God beyond measure. I mean, we have become one of the wealthiest nations in the world. I mean, we have more wealth, you know, per capita, per person than we do literally anywhere else in the world. We have the freedom of religion. We have the freedom to worship God. I mean, we have... We have freedom here in the United States of America, and it hasn't been given to us for the sake of us becoming king. It's been given to us for the sake of influence. Proverbs chapter 3, verse 9, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruits of all thine increase. In other words, God has given us this fatness, not for the sake of me becoming king, but for the sake of honoring and glorifying are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Okay, God has given it to us for the sake of those missionaries you have on that board. He's given it to you for the sake of, of the people here in this community and, 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 and the neighbors across the street to be able to take the gospel of Jesus Christ and give it to them and, and to take it to people across Kentucky and across the United States of America and literally around the world. God has given to us that fatness. We have been given an influence. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 31, whether therefore ye eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. We are to take that fatness that God has given to us, that blessing that God has has bestowed upon us, and, and we're to use it for his honor and glory, to promote his kingdom and his authority and his His rule in this world, and let me tell you what, God rules and reigns in the affairs of mankind. And, you know, we are here to, you know, to advance his kingdom. You know, we're here to glorify him and to lift him up. Going back to Judges chapter 9. The trees haven't given up on having a king. In verse number 10. It says, and the tree said unto the fig tree, come thou and reign over us. But the fig tree said unto them, should I forsake my sweetness and my good fruits and go to be promoted over the trees? Now they come, next they come to the fig tree and say to the fig tree, fig tree, will you be our king? What does the fig tree say? Fig tree says, oh no, I'm not going to be your king. What's the reason? The reason is, as he mentions there in verse number 11, should I forsake my sweetness and my good fruits? to go to be promoted over the trees. What is that sweetness? What is that good fruit? And tell you, where did that sweetness and that good fruit come from? Can I say it's the way God made it? It's the way God made that tree. And, and those things are given to us by, by God. What is that sweetness? Look at Proverbs chapter 27. Proverbs chapter 27, verse number 9. says here, ointment and perfume rejoice the heart, so that the sweetness of a man's friend by hearty counsel. 
Where does the sweetness come from? The Bible says in John 8, 32, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. John 8, 36, if the Son therefore shall make you free, ye shall be free indeed. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, therefore if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. What is that? What's that sweetness? That sweetness comes to us because we are children of God. We have the Holy Spirit of God living within us. We have the anointing of God. We have the assurance of our salvation. We have this relationship with God. We have been given that sweetness. And that good fruit, what is that good fruit? Where that good fruit come from? That good fruit comes because we're yielded and surrendered to the Holy Spirit of God in our lives. And that fruit, that fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. That fruit has been given to us by God. The fruit of the Spirit, one fruit. One fruit manifested in nine different ways in our life. We have been given that fruit of the Spirit not for the purpose of us becoming king, but it's been given to us for the sake of influence. Okay? We have been given the sweetness. We have been given the good fruit for the sake of influence. Now, let me say, the trees haven't given up on having a king yet. Go back to Judges chapter 9. In verse number 12. It says, then said the trees unto the vine, come thou and reign over us. And the vine said unto them, should I leave my wine, which cheereth God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? Now, I'm going to point out to you the obvious here. The trees are still looking for a king, but the vine is not a tree. But they're still looking for a king, and they're, and they're coming to the vine, asking the vine to be their king. Now, the vine still has a usefulness, doesn't it? It still has an influence that you can get those grapes. But the vine says to them, oh, no, I'm not going to be your king. And what's the reason? The reason, he gives in verse 13, should I leave my wine, which cheereth God and man, and go to be promoted over the trees? Now, let me point out here, first of all, to you, should I, says, should I leave my wine? Where is the wine? The wine is still in the cluster of the grapes. The vine is speaking and says, should I leave my wine? It hasn't been harvested yet. It's still growing in the cluster of the grapes. He's not talking about intoxicating beverage here, but he's talking about the, the new wine, the fruits of the vine. And, you know, and it's, it's, it's new wine here that he's talking about. It's not talking about alcohol. It says here, should I leave my wine, which cheereth God in man? Now, wait a second. Cheereth God? Is God depressed that he needs cheered up? Well, no, that's not what it's saying, is it? What is it saying when it says that wine which cheereth God? That word cheer means to rejoice. Are there things that influences that we have that we can make God in heaven rejoice? Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. Jesus goes into the parable of the lost sheep. Actually, it's really one parable in Luke chapter 15, the work of the, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit working together in each one in their function of salvation and bringing us to, to Christ. And, you know, you've got the, the, the shepherd going out and to get the sheep, and he's got one that's straight away. And in verse number 7, and he found the sheep. He said, I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than over the ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. You know, the shepherd found the sheep and, and Jesus makes the, the parallel to heaven. There's joy in heaven. Heaven is rejoicing when one sinner comes to repentance. The woman loses the coin, a picture of the Holy Spirit. She goes out and searches diligently, looking, sweeping, cleaning every crack and corner of the house and searching with that lamp. And she finds it. And she says here in verse number 10, it says, Likewise, I say unto you, there's joy in the presence of the angels of God 
over one sinner that repenteth. Who is that, that there's joy in the presence of the angels of God? Who is in the presence of the angels of God but God himself? Do you realize that heaven rejoices every time a sinner repents and comes to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ? Let me tell you what is your influence. Let me tell you, you take the gospel of Jesus Christ out of this room. Let me tell you, you share the gospel with somebody. They pray. They put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Let me tell you, heaven rejoices and that cheers the heart of God and man because you're bringing that man into that relationship with God. It cheers as the heart of, of God and man there like nothing else can do. But when you talk about that, that the, the fig tree and you talk about the, the wine there and the, and the vine and you talk about these things, let me tell you that one of the things that that, that olive tree produced was olive oil. That vine, it produced the wine. That wine was used in the sacrifices in the temple. That, that anointing oil, the olive oil was used in the temple as well. They were used in the sacrifices there in the Old Testament. And I want you to understand here, you know, that, you know, really the greatest influence that we have is upon God himself. The greatest influence that we have is upon God himself. Romans 12, verse 1, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice. When they brought that anointing oil and that wine there into the temple and it was part of those sacrifices, they were giving themselves to God. And there's nothing greater in our influence you know, as children of God, that we can give ourselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. That you can give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ in a, a life that is surrendered and yielded to him. As You know, you saw these five men. They've given their life to the Lord. They're going to pastor churches. That's their goal. I mean, they've given their life to the Lord. Many of you have given your life to the Lord. I have given my life to the Lord. You know, and, and, and we tell you that life that is surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ is a life that, that has an influence. But I, can I tell you the greatest influence that we have is upon God himself. We oftentimes say prayer changes things. Spurgeon put it this way. Prayer is the slender nerve that moves the muscle of omnipotence. Prayer. I'm going to tell you, there's, there's so many verses that we can look at on, on prayer. Let's just let's look at Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 4, and verse number 16. I think I heard somebody reading my notes. Hebrews chapter 4, verse number 16. It says, let us therefore come boldly into the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen. We have the authority to go into the very throne room of God by prayer at any moment of the day or night. That we can go into that very throne room of prayer and enter into the very presence of God and literally grab a hold of the horns of the altar where God himself is seated, and we can bring our petitions for him in behalf of our family, in behalf of our city, in behalf of our friends, our church, our nation, our missions around the world. We have an influence upon God himself. Prayer changes things. Get, can I just ask a dumb question? When you look at what's going on in this, in this nation, I mean, I mean you, you've got people in power that have an agenda that's to destroy America. And they, then they're trying to do this, and it gets roadblocked. And they're trying to do this, and they get stopped. And they're trying to do this, and I mean, in the midst of all of this, with these people that are trying to, to 
you know, to push this crazy stuff upon us, uh, abortion gets overturned. I mean, you, you know, you look at that and you say, you know, this is not what the Biden administration wanted to happen under their rule. You know, it's not what's, what, what they expected. But let me tell you, as I've traveled across America these last several years and, 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 and what took place in the recent election and, 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 and you know, what's, how churches across this nation, let me tell you, there's churches across this nation that are praying for America. I have to say, maybe God answered one of those prayers. God heard some little old lady or some little old man crying out to him. And God is at work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. And thankful that we're able to Let me tell you what, by the power of prayer, we have the ability to push back against this evil. I tell you, we have an influence. Now, go back to Judges chapter 9. The the trees haven't given up on having a king yet. In verse number 14, it said, Then said all the trees unto the bramble, Come thou and reign over us. And the bramble bush said unto the trees, If in truth you anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow, and if not, let fire come out from the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Now, the trees, next, they they go to the bramble and ask the bramble bush to be their king. Now, can I point out to you the obvious? The bramble bush is not a tree. But the trees haven't given up on having a king. And they come to the bramble bush, and and you understand what the bramble bush is. I mean, you get out here through these woods, and you're going to come across some thorny bushes. I mean, and you're going to get those those thorns in your your socks, and and, and they're going to get into your legs, and you get your hands in there, they're going to get into your hands. I mean, those thorny bushes are going to hurt. And they come to the bramble bush. Let me tell you, the bramble bush has no purpose at all. It is a totally worthless bush. And the bramble bush here is being paralleled to Abimelech. And they come to the bramble bush and say to the bramble bush, bramble bush, will you be our king? And what does the bramble bush say? Oh, yes, I'll be your king. What does the bramble bush say? It says, if in truth you anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust. You know what the bramble bush is saying? I'm here from the government. I'm here to help you. Seriously. Yeah, if in truth you put me, you know, come and put your trust, your trust in my shadow. If I want to get shade, I'm going to get more shade under the olive tree, the fig tree, and even the vine. But if I'm going to get shade under the bramble bush, I've got to get awful close to it. And the closer I get to it, the more I'm going to get hurt. Can I tell you, the White House, the Congress is full of bramble bushes right now. But can I say this to you? Don't be the bramble bush. Don't be the bramble bush. Because you don't want people to get close to you and get hurt. They say, how do I know I'm the bramble bush? Well, that olive tree. Should I leave my fatness wherewith by me they honor God and man? We become the bramble bush when we forget that those blessings have been given to us by God. And we're not using them to honor and glorify God like the way God wants us to. I become the bramble bush as we looked at that fig tree and I forsake my sweetness and my good fruits. And and you talk about just, you know, becoming sour, forsaking their sweetness, that good fruit. I'm no longer yielded to the Holy Spirit. I become angry and bitter and and, and, and indifferent to the things of God. And, and, you know, and, 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 and we become the bramble bush. 
Okay? I become the bramble bush when, when, I, when, I, when I leave that ability to make heaven rejoice. When I forget that God wants me to win souls and bring people to him, he wants me to take the gospel out to these people. I lose, my, my, I, I lose that ability to cheer God when I lose that ability to touch the throne room of God in prayer and go to God and bring my petitions and my requests to him. I become the bramble bush. If in truth you anoint me king over you, then come and put your trust in my shadow. Psalms 91.1, he that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High is going to abide under the shadow. What is Abimelech doing? He's taking the place of God. He's taking that position. He says, come, put your trust in my shadow. Can I tell you that in God, he is our sufficiency. And that's where I started. Our sufficiency is of God. Our sufficiency is in Jesus Christ. Okay? Our sufficiency must be in him. And, 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 and you know, when, when, when the bramble bush wants to become king, he wants to elevate himself to that position. You know, he's, he's taking that position away from God. That olive oil was used for the anointing. Can I tell you the greatest influence that we have is the anointing of God upon us? The greatest influence that we have is, is that sweetness and that good fruit that God has given to us. You know, that, uh, that, that, that dwelling in the secret place of the Most High, you know, that gives us that relationship with God and the authority to enter into his very presence by, by prayer and to bring our petitions before him and to know that God is going to hear and answer my prayer. And I tell you, you dwell in the secret place. That secret place is that place of thanksgiving because God has given to us the fatness. That, that secret place is that place where I have been given that sweetness and that good fruit. Why? Because I'm yielded to God. I'm yielded to the Holy Spirit. You know, hey, that, that, that secret place is, is that place where I have the ability to cheer the heart of God. I have the ability to influence the heart of God by prayer. I have the ability to move heaven on my knees at the behalf of whatever the request is that we're lifting up to him. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. What goes on here in the rest of this chapter is nothing but murder and treachery and deception, and betrayal, all this crazy stuff goes on. But I want you to see the last two verses of the chapter. Verse 56 and 57. It says, Thus God rendered the wickedness of Abimelech, which he did unto his father, in slaying his seventy brethren, and all the evil of the men of Shechem did God render upon their heads, and upon them came the what? The curse of Jotham, the son of Jerubbabel. He started on Mount Gerizim, the Mount of Blessing, but upon them came the curse. Why? They did not take heed to the parable. Instead, they made Abimelech king and followed him. And when we are right with God, the blessings of God are ours. But if we refuse, if we try to take those things to ourselves and we use them for our own sufficiency, let me tell you, we live in the United States of America. 
I would dare say that even though this country is in danger, most of you are financially secure. I don't think there's anybody that maybe is really struggling with finances. I don't know. Maybe there are. But can I say we have that blessing from God? And it's easy to become sufficient in ourselves. We have that relationship with God. We have that sweetness. We have that, that good fruit. It's easy to become sufficient, self-sufficient. We're going to church. We've grown up in church. We've been in church our whole life. It's easy to become self-sufficient. And we can go through the motions of prayer. We can go through the motions of going to church. We can go through the motions of giving the gospel of Jesus Christ to people. But in reality, our sufficiency is of God. And I believe that we in the United States of America need to come back to a day when our sufficiency is of God and of Him alone and all the time by Him and not of ourselves. We need to have that sufficiency in the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know exactly how the Lord has used this message in you, in your hearts this evening. But I'm going to pray and turn it over and let you do the invitation, however you feel, or whoever is doing that. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time. Thank you for your word. I pray that you'll bless, Lord, in this time of invitation. Lord, may you truly be our sufficiency. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.